Okay, I think we're going to get started. It's 4.30. So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Karina Weinstein, and I am from FXB. FXB is an... <laughs> FXB is an international development organization that works on social justice, poverty alleviation, and climate resilience. And I lead the FXB Climate Advocates Program that informs, empowers, and mobilizes youth to implement climate solutions. And I'm really excited to moderate this wonderful panel on the role of public schools as national climate leaders. So we will have discussion for about 45 minutes, and then we want to hear questions from you for the last 15 minutes. So please just, um, you know, get your questions ready. We'll have you stand up and ask your question. So we want to hear from you. This is really a discussion for you to take away frameworks, ideas, programs, and initiatives to take back to your community. So the FXB Climate Advocates Program informs, empowers, and mobilizes youth to implement climate solutions. We work with youth from around the world on climate education and climate action. We know that um, you know whether we have uh, youth from maybe the most affluent community in the United States to all the way to a remote rural area in Sub-Saharan Africa, young people are telling us with a resounding, a collective voice that they're not learning enough about climate change and climate solutions in schools, and they're not really leaving schools, uh, education with, equipped with tools to take action at the level and the pace that we need. Also, as part of our program, we very intentionally um, support young people to take action. We know that climate action is a great antidote to eco-anxiety and enhances climate resilience. And so when young people start thinking, well, what should I do? How should I enter the climate space? They, they turn to their schools because that's really the most immediate community and a community where they're an engaged stakeholder that, you know, can really, where they can really affect change. I'll give you a few examples of um, projects that our advocates have worked on. So Amelia from Denver, she uh, co-leads Denver Public Schools for Climate Action, where she worked with her peers across the Denver public school system to pass a sustainability policy that's pushing the school district to move towards electric buses that we'll hear about today, sustainable source cafeteria food, climate education that we're gonna learn about today as well. So this is an example of what young people are doing Avi from Jupiter, Florida, you know, took environmental science and said, this is great, but I think we need to move, you know, take this climate knowledge and climate education beyond sort of the AP environmental science class. And he started a community garden in his school that engages students in a very hands-on way. Uh, Amanda from Michigan, she actually worked with her peers to replace um, styrofoam um, utensils and uh, trays in her school with reusable plastic. So we know that young people are taking action, they're engaged, and schools is a place where that happens. So today we've had we've heard uh, great panels. You know we've heard both a lot of optimism around the investments, the unprecedented investments from IRA that are being made in environmental justice, in the clean energy transition. We heard a little bit of pessimism um, around what can happen with elections in November, and but. You know, could all of this be rolled back? But the good news is today we're only giving you hope. There's no pessimism from anything you're going to hear today. And regardless of what happens with the election, that the, what you're going to learn today can be implemented. It can be taken to your communities. So we know that schools are really poised to be the national leaders for climate action, and we're going to learn about how today. We have a really exciting panel. We have four people here and two young panelists on Zoom. So we're gonna try to balance this uh, with Zoom and in person, it's really wonderful. It's, so we're gonna have an intergenerational panel because we know that young people are at the forefront of change, of climate action, and we need to hear from them. And they're the primary kind of stakeholder in the school, right? Both for you know getting the skills they need to be climate leaders, as well as influencing schools um, and the carbon footprint, right? And what schools as entities can do. We also will learn about different dimensions. We'll learn about electric school buses, climate education and teacher training, schoolyards, K-12 education policy for, for the education sector as a whole to become a climate leader. Very exciting. Well, um, so just to kick, so no more talking from me. Let's kick off this panel. And I want to start with Audrey. We'll start with Audrey and Karis because I think youth need to be at the forefront of this conversation. And let me just pose the first question to everyone. Just share a little bit with our audience about innovative practices or initiatives you're involved with 
that significantly advance climate <coughs> action in schools. Audrey, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Audrey. Um, I'm a rising senior at Walnut Hills High School, which is in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, thank you for having me. This is a really awesome opportunity. So um, I am the Electrify Cincinnati Public Schools campaign co-founder and student leader. And so this campaign is part of a larger national effort um, from Citizens Climate Lobby called the Great School Electrification Challenge. And the goal of this challenge is essentially to have students at the center um, changing energy policy in their school districts to uh, you know, speed up the clean energy transition in a way that is as environmentally just as possible. Um, and so this campaign started a little under a year ago and in a little under a year, we were able to successfully pass um, a renewable energy and electrification resolution, um, which was a huge success for us, um, especially because the school district that I am in is very large. So there's um, a lot of things that the board members were having to deal with. Um, and you know, any sort of policy change is gonna come across those challenges. Um, and beyond this success of having this energy policy passed, which basically outlines a plan for the district to transition off of fossil fuels to renewable energy, um, electric school buses, electric appliances, all of that wonderful stuff. Um, we've also been making sure that our impact is not just on our school district, so uh, the Great School Electrification Challenge provides um, mentorship for you know, successful campaigns to help other campaigns that are getting off the ground or that are having challenges to um, continue to push their school for these energy policy changes. And I think that student to student mentorship is super important. And then also we are um, being connected with you know, policy experts um, energy providers, all of those wonderful adult people who have a lot of experience that can help us reach our advocacy goals. Um, and just uh, one more tidbit is that, um, you know, we're, we're already seeing the effects of these energy policies with, or of, of this energy policy within our school district. So there is already a pilot and solar panel project in the works which is really exciting um, on one of the, I believe it's 62 buildings in CPS. They're um, planning on installing rooftop solar. And then we recently received a grant um, or the district received a grant for 32 electric school buses, which is super exciting. So things are already happening. And I think you can never underestimate the power of a youth voice. Um, and yeah, that that's pretty much all I have to say about where we are right now. And obviously we're gonna to continue to expand our impact and excited to be on this panel. I'll pass it over <laughs> to Karis. Thank you. Karis? So yeah, uh, hi everyone. So the practice that's had the most impact for my schools is student-led activism as well. So real briefly, my name is Karis Shear. I'm a rising high school senior from Carrollton, Texas, which is in the suburbs of Dallas. So both my immediate local area and my state are on the more conservative side of the political spectrum. And as such, there isn't as much of a push for sustainability, especially when it comes to our public schools. So to address this, Veda Ganesan, a dear friend of mine and I, we met through CCL's uh, National Youth Action Team, and we actually co-founded DFW Gen Green to address the lack of climate action within our area and schools. So DFW Gen Green is a 501c3 nonprofit entirely led and composed of students within our school district, which is Louisville Independent School District. And we've presented at board meetings advocating for the passage of an electrification resolution, also as a part of the Great School Electrification Challenge. And we are also advocating for the implementation of green spaces. And most recently, we're working to implement a district-wide su student sustainability advisory council within our district. However, we also believe that the foundation of climate action in public schools is community support and engagement. So our team also runs local booths, has published op-eds, and produces a monthly blog. And we're also working on a local sustainable art show and publishing an educational children's book about 
recycling that we hope to donate to schools within our district, especially elementary schools. And all of this is to ensure that we have youth-led advocacy fighting for change in the spaces that affect us the most, our schools and local communities, which is near and dear to us, especially since being in a more conservative area, a lot of this change isn't going to happen until we raise our voices and push for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey and Karis. Really inspiring. Dan, do you want to share with us? Uh, thanks. This is great. It's uh, really fun to be on this panel with these uh, uh, wonderful students and, and my co-panelists. Uh, I'm Dan Lashoff. I'm the director of the World Resources Institute U.S. program. Uh, WRI is a nonprofit that works on environmental and uh, development challenges around the world. Uh, we, in addition to the U.S. and eight other countries, but I have the privilege of leading the U.S. program here to talk about our initiative on electric school buses, which we've been running in partnership with the Bezos Earth Fund since uh, the year 2020. Uh, so we're in year four. Uh, and so why did we focus on electric school buses? Um, so school buses are the largest public transportation fleet in the United States. There are 480,000 school buses. Currently, 90% of them run on diesel fuel. That diesel fuel is a known carcinogen, and it is pumping pollution directly into the lungs of some of our most vulnerable uh, populations. So uh, our view was we, we need to electrify the entire transportation fleet. We're working on other aspects of it, but uh, school buses ought to be among the first uh, because of their impacts. And in addition to the direct health effects, uh, diesel pollution has also been shown to impair uh, students' cognitive uh, performance. So it's also a direct uh, effect on their performance in schools. The other thing that we heard that was uh, as we've gotten into it and we've gotten more school buses on the road, a little bit of a surprise, but they're so much quieter inside that students actually arrive at school uh, in a much better mood, ready to learn. Uh, the drivers love them. Drivers can hear if students are fighting in the back, so there's less fighting. I mean, there are just multiple benefits um, from, from electric school buses. So um, where we are is uh, we were able to, along with uh, many other activists, uh, help secure a, a new program as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed in 2021, the Clean School Bus Program run by EPA that dedicates $5 billion to clean school buses, um, both electric and some other modes, which are not as clean, uh, but um, fortunately, more than 90% of all the applications and funding that has gone out under the clean school bus program has have been for electric buses. Um, uh, in addition to that, we've worked on a number of state policies, uh, and we now have seven states that have some kind of commitment to transition their bus fleet. Uh, to to clean electric school buses, different time frames, but uh, with funding attached to them. So overall, uh, there's uh, about nine billion dollars of both federal and state funding dedicated to electric school buses. Uh, over twelve thousand uh, school buses, electric school buses, are either in operation or on order. Most of those are on order, so I think about three, a little over 3,000 actually operating now. That's good, uh, but it's only 2.5% of the uh, 480,000 bus fleet. So our view is that every kid deserves a clean ride to school, and our goal is to create unstoppable momentum to transition the entire fleet to electric uh, and, and have that uh, well underway by the end of this decade. Um, so I'll stop there and look forward to uh, talk further about how that relates to the other initiatives that people are doing and the kind of overall vision for, for schools as climate leaders. Thank you. Margaret? Hello. Awesome. Um, so my name is Margaret. I'm one of the co-founders of Subject to Climate, a nonprofit organization. And our vision is really that all students are, you know, learn about climate change and become active stewards of our environment. And you can just see the effects of what happens when this happens. So really thankful that we have um, youth panelists here as well. So we know that students want to learn about climate change, but 
when we asked many teachers, and I was a high school social studies teacher for several years, and one of the biggest reasons why teachers don't teach about climate change is that they just don't have time in their curriculum, and they don't see how it fits in. And teachers are already stressed and have so much on their plate. So that's one reason. And then the other reason is that they were never taught about climate change. It's a rel relatively new. So that's what we started off with and why we built Subject to Climate. So we're a free platform with teacher developed materials. And we've also curated because it's not the lack of resources out there. It's just that teachers don't have enough time to figure out that right resource that fits into that lesson that they're going to teach the next day. And we also have aggregated professional development opportunities because, again, every teacher needs something different. We also have our own professional development, and we've reached over 400,000 educators, even just educators looking for a fun writing lesson or something that engages students in relevant project-based learning or math lessons. And there, you know, there was a slideshow with a couple of cool lessons on Spanish, for example, or PE, um, even elementary PE. So there's a huge opportunity there while not adding so much burden on our educators that are already burdened. Um, another thing that's really uh, important on what we're working on is that there are a lot of states that are prioritizing climate change education. New Jersey is the first one. Two years ago, um, they integrated climate change standards across all grade levels and subjects. Now, I think there are 10 other states that want to do something similar or want to add professional and or add professional development money for that, which is great. And so we also go into those states and help coordinate the stakeholders there and make sure all their materials are on a resource hub like ours so that it's easier for teachers and we do it so it's place-based. So for example, we'll curate resources of New Jersey, for example, we'll train cohorts of educators in New Jersey to create lesson plans about New Jersey that align to New Jersey student learning standards so that it's really usable for teachers. So I think there's a huge opportunity here. I'm really happy that there is a such panel and um, there's more on how this connects, but it all starts with student knowledge and Thank you. Danielle? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Danielle Dank. I'm with the Trust for Public Land. We're a national nonprofit working across the country to help connect people to the Those benefits include health, climate resilience, community, um, and with the schoolyard work that I'll talk about learning, of course. So um, I direct our schoolyards initiative, which is um, really on a mission transform every single schoolyard out there, all two million acres, into a joyous, wonderful park-like environment for learning. And we know this model can work and it has worked. We've been doing this for about 30 years, starting in the East Coast, New York City and Newark, New Jersey, where we have transformed over 225 schoolyards into these amazing places for learning and, you know, also opening them to the community after hours and absorbing a lot of stormwater in the process. So um, these spaces really are an intervention, we think of them, uh, in health, in climate resilience, and in learning. Students that have exposure to these spaces have better attendance rates. They have better retention of subject matter material. Their, um, their performance goes up in ELA and mathematics. And it helps the teachers, the retention for teachers and staff is increased because of these school years. So the benefit to the education sector is profound. Um, we are finding that, however, there's not sustainable funding across the board. So we are working and building a coalition along the way to really make this a new reality for students and for teachers and for community across the country. Thank you. Michelle? Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Packer. I am a senior program associate for This is Planet Ed, maybe more importantly, a former eighth grade science teacher and also a graduate of the Ed School here. So especially happy to be back here. Um, just for a little bit of background, This is Planet Ed is an initiative of the Energy and Environment Program at the Aspen Institute. And we aim to unlock the power of the education sector across the board for climate solutions. It's clear that young people have the solutions that we need to drive climate action and we are responsible for empowering them with the skills and knowledge they need to do so. Um, so we work, as I mentioned, in early years, which is zero to eight, K-12 climate action, higher education climate action. I'll touch on those two, K-12 and higher education mostly today. But we also have a fourth stream in uh, planet media. So understanding that kids um, don't stop learning when they leave the school building. Uh, this initiative works to have more positive solutions-based messaging in our children's media. 
Um, so, though there are many innovative practices, and we've heard a lot of them already, uh, the one that I'm going to uplift today is the development of local K-12 climate action plans. Um, and this is part of a greater initiative. This is when Ed used to be known as K-12 Climate Action. Um, it's co-chaired by former Secretary of Education John King and former Administrator Jason Todd Whitman, also uh, former Governor of New Jersey, um, as well as amazing educators, students, and leaders such as Dan here from around the country who are really leading on this issue. Uh, they developed a K-12 Climate Action Plan, which outlines many bright spots, recommendations for local policymakers, state policymakers, federal policymakers, really anybody can find themselves in this plan. So I'll just scratch the surface. I encourage you to check it out at thisisplanet.org. Uh, but the main recommendation of this plan is that school districts have local K-12 climate action plans. So very similar to what a city might have, but really focused on the needs and the strengths of the students in the schools. And so when you look at these plans, there are kind of four main buckets of solutions. The first is mitigation, which we've heard a lot about today. That's electric school buses. That's ensuring that the meals students eat are sustainable and locally produced. Um, that's passing 100% renewable energy resolutions. Uh, the second bucket is adaptation. So that's our sustainable schoolyards. Um, that's thinking about how schools can serve students even during climate disasters. Do they have virtual learning plans in place? Are they prepared to provide the community and the students around them with the resources that they need during disasters? The third bucket, of course, is education, which you might think of first. Um, so that's our standards, our curriculum, our teaching and learning, as well as the career technical education programs that can prepare our students for a green workforce. And then fourth bucket is equity, ensuring that the schools who have historically been underinvested in, who haven't had the same climate or educational opportunities, are the first. Um, so that we can ensure that this transition is a just transition and not leading to the same results that we see today. Um, so importantly, these effects of climate are going to look very different across the country. That's flooding in some places, wildfire smoke in other places, heat days in others. So these climate action plans are not going to look exactly the same. They're going to be very unique. And that's as education was intended to be designed. Um, and so just a few examples. We've heard a lot already, but in Prince George's County, Maryland, they're working to develop a comprehensive climate action plan for their school district with parents and school board members. Uh, in Santa Barbara, California, school board members have worked to develop a microgrid uh, for solar energy. So not only are they only to power their uh, own school district during disaster, they're also able to power the communities around them. Um, and then finally, in Batesville, Arkansas, um, they've created so much solar energy that they're able to take the savings from what they've done and reinvest it back in the school district as teacher salaries. So they're now the highest paid school district in that region. So I think the opportunities are just immense and that this can look amazing in lots of different places. Um, as long as we are, as our uh, co-panelists said, engaging student voices in this, making sure that they're at the table and also making sure that we're engaging them with the solutions. Wow, thank you so much, it's so inspiring. I love how what everyone shared, it really forms pieces of a bigger of the puzzle, right? And so if we can implement all of this, we'll, you know, as a parent of two school age kids, I think we can really make schools as leaders. Now, we know that every school district and every school has a lot of stakeholders involved, right? Let's talk a little bit about collaboration and partnerships. And we heard from Karis about engaging the importance of engaging community. So how can schools, educators, parents, policymakers, community members all work together to advance these initiatives? Maybe we could go this way and then to Karis and Audrey. <laughs> we'll do it backwards. Michelle? All right. <laughs> right. So I think it's important to note that every single stakeholder, every single sector has a role to play in addressing climate change. Um, and so when you look across the board, every education stakeholder, whether we're talking about parents, teachers, uh, school board members, or students, have a very unique role and strength. Um, at Planet Ed, we developed a series of toolkits for different stakeholders. So we worked in partnership with the PTA and Mothers Out Front to develop a parent climate action toolkit that um, allows them to have better conversations about climate with their community members and fellow parents. Um, this summer, we're releasing a student climate action toolkit that was developed by student leaders. Um, that really helps them to realize their own voice. Um, and for school board members, we are working with a group called Undaunted K-12 and a group called School Board Partners to create a um, model resolution, kind of combining resolutions from all over the country. We've taken the pieces and made it into a draft resolution so that a school board member who wants to take action on this can kind of pick it up and develop it to their own needs. Um, although these individual roles are really important, I think collaboration is key. And so um, as we already heard from some of our panelists, uh, there are these advisory boards or councils that are being developed to pass K-12 climate action plans. 
and these have engagement, uh, equal engagement, equal voice from all of the stakeholders, educators, students, um, facilities managers, community members, and they have expressed that while maybe at the beginning of the process, they don't know how to do everything, they might not know, understand charging infrastructure, they may not understand how to build a solar panel, but with the right voices at the table, they can find these solutions together. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And I think the more resources we can put in front of people to build their capacity, the more successful these kind of partnerships will be. Danielle? Yeah, and these are great examples, and I love all your toolkits, Michelle. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think that a big part of that I would just add to is making sure it's relevant. Right. You know, we talked about working in underserved areas, places that don't know um, necessarily what they should be demanding. Right. You know, the fact that a schoolyard looks like an asphalt lot surrounded by chain link fencing in underserved communities. Well, that's not the same in well-served communities. But the children there, they don't see anything different. Teachers don't see a lot different. The parents think that's normal. So we really need to harness what is to show them that what they could be going for, what they could be striving for, raising their voices around is what they should absolutely have. So when we work in community with local community members and parents and teachers, we work to demonstrate a pilot that everyone then gathers around, that everyone demands the attention around, that becomes something the school district realizes they need to add to all the rest of their system. So Really making the, the pilot relevant in an equitable way is very important. But then it's also arming the community, the, the, the advocates with tools so that they know what voice they can raise and how to raise it. So toolkits are a huge opportunity. Um, I want to talk a little bit about LA Unified. So um, LA is a place where ha they have um, vast acres of asphalt, right? It's a community that is extremely hot in the summer and even in the spring and fall. It's a place where there's very few trees on their campuses. And parents, community members, students, nonprofits all got together and demanded something different. Um, and then actually right now in LA Times, there's a piece on the fact that they're now advocating for a $1 billion bond, a carve out from their larger bond package to be allocated to schoolyards. So that can really change the dynamic. And I don't think they would have necessarily pointed attention to that if they didn't know that it's something that could reach for. Yeah, that's a wonderful example of all voices coming together to really demand something different. Thank you. Margaret? Um, in response to that, Danielle, like uh, LAUSD, to my knowledge, also so many community members, retired educators, current educators, parents, they all came together. They actually passed a board resolution mm -hmm. to integrate climate change across all grade levels and subjects, which is fantastic. And now they're figuring out how do we support educators. So you can see a lot of the action students, parents, and community members, retired educators, current educators. So they're certainly powerful in making these initiatives and then thinking about ways to help support education systems. So just wanted to make that connection, which is extremely important. Um, another area, it's really important to go into communities with an asset-based mindset rather than a deficit mindset where, oh, there's not enough um, resources to implement curricular changes. Oh, our students aren't going to benefit from this because we still need to focus on reading and writing, you know, or, and it's really easy to do this. And it's, it sometimes it's, it's stressful in education, but I think what's really important is taking stock of what is available in a state, like in a community, like what are all the amazing assets they all have? So one way that we do that is when we go into a state that has environmental education initiatives, we actually form an advisory committee to really look at, okay, what are all the nonprofits already existing here doing? And what are the state agencies doing? What resources are they providing? What professional development already exists? Um, what are the other educators already doing? For example, in Oregon, educators banded together and they created the Oregon Educators for Climate Education. So they already had this network and they already did a summer institute to create lesson plans. So it's not like we're going in there and going like, okay, we have the solution for everything that you need for climate change education. We go in there and see what's there and how we can elevate those so that it reaches more teachers because sometimes the issue isn't, again, more things, but how do we make it easier for them to reach and elevate their work to teachers at the time and moment that teachers need it? Because that's the issue that when teachers are presented all these things, it's hard, but it's when they're looking for that 
resource when they're looking for that um, speaker, when they're looking for that data. So I think that's really important when engaging community uh, members. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Dan? Yeah, that's great. Um, I agree with all of that. I, you know, thinking about the, the climate movement as a whole, there's been a big effort to recognize that we need action at all levels. So that often is, you know, cities, states, federal government, international. School districts are often left out of that conversation. So it's really great to bring them in. Uh, it's great that the Citizens Climate Lobby has a campaign around that to other organizations. So the real focus on it's another jurisdiction that's sort of not any of those other things that people normally think of first. So, um, and it's a great place for, for students to engage and uh, parents and community members because there's a school in every community and in most communities, school buses driving through them, putting pollution uh, directly into those communities. So um, that's, uh, I, I think, really valuable uh, lesson. The other, uh, specific to school buses, I'll just mention this. Um, one of the biggest challenges that school districts have when they move towards, they decide they want to electrify their fleet and maybe they buy their land, is they don't have any experience running charging infrastructure. So a really important partner to engage immediately as soon as the school is thinking about electrifying is their local utility. Uh, that local utility is going to be responsible for uh, at least uh, bringing in the make-ready infrastructure to run the wire to make sure they have the capacity to serve the school uh, in order to recharge the buses. At, in most districts, buses are centrally located at a, at a depot at night. That's where they're likely to be charged. Um, so you need to plan for that. And that can take a, a long time. So it's really important to do that early on. Um, and then um, the, the utilities can also uh, play a role in financing um, buses. Uh, they get a benefit from selling electricity. Um, so that, that can be a role depends on the community. There's also other, uh, uh, depending on the district, some districts own their own buses. Many districts um, get transportation as a service from, uh, from a company that's set up to do that. Uh, one based in Massachusetts, Highland Electric, is 100% based on electric school buses. Uh, and they provide transportation as a service. Uh, to districts. So that's another partner that districts can uh, rely on. But other ones that are established, like First Student, uh, Zoom, uh, uh, are increasingly um, offering electric school buses as an option for districts uh, that they work with. Thank you. So, so partnerships are key. Karis? Yeah, so kind of expanding off of Dan just said, I can definitely see how people don't even consider public schools as being part of this conversation. And maybe this comes more from my experience being in Texas. A lot of times these conversations aren't even happening. So specifically for my area, I think a huge thing would just be a effective discourse with all stakeholders, stakeholders involved. It's a fairly simple concept, but pretty revolutionary for my area. So a lot of times, like, schools and policymakers, there's this disconnect from the community, um, mostly because it doesn't meet a political agenda. So creating spaces such as like student advisory councils, panels like this, meetings with policymakers, or even just community meetings at like city halls, council meetings, even community events, I think that can go a long way to creating these conversations to implement change, especially in areas where these conversations haven't been happening. Like my school district hadn't even considered electric vehicles and trying to put in place sustainability initiatives, such as putting more green spaces on campuses where there's concrete. My campus has mud and dying plants from the Texas sun all the time. And my district hadn't even been considering this stuff because it's not even a conversation that's happening. So the big thing for me is just creating spaces for these conversations to happen, particularly in conservative circles. Thank you. Audrey? Yeah, um, I'll be brief. So Karis, you just mentioned, mentioned the importance of community events. And I just wanted to provide an example of a recent experience that I had that I felt really highlighted that value because I think Another thing that um, schools, are, or sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, um, aren't recognized as is, is, is sort of these vibrant community spaces, right? Yes, they're places where students learn and grow, but ultimately they often make up a huge part of the identity of any neighborhood or community. Mm -hmm. 
especially when it's like a neighborhood school. Um, so I recently attended a green schoolyard summit, which was incredible because it was this intersection of um, policymakers, uh, any sort of community stakeholder, nonprofits, um, you know, people who were working on the facilities um, and and utility side of things, um, students from across the school district all coming together to just be in community with one another um, and, and talk about what their vision is for the future and, you know, have food together and um, just be in community. And I think just that simple act of being together and, and sort of dreaming big is really important. Um, so that's my brief point. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. What I hear is a common theme is, you know, maybe uh, people can be disengaged with the political process and don't participate in their community board or don't really think about their state senators or even their federal officials. But if you have children or you know someone with children, which I think is pretty much everyone, schools are going to be a part of your life. So in a way, it can be this unifying force, this pull force to pull people into the climate space, even if otherwise they wouldn't really be engaged in other kind of policy spaces. And I mean, I, as a parent of two school age kids, schools are a community. This is where your not only your children not only learn, but this is where they interact, where they learn about values. And, and it just, I, it's so important. And I love just being in community and having that space, you know, to be with people with a shared kind of vision, a goal. So it's really powerful. So, you know, we have a short timeline to take bold climate action. So we need to be ambitious, right? We want green schoolyards in every school. We need a compulsory climate education in every state. We need K-12 action plans in every single school and school district around the country and definitely around the world as well. So can you talk to me a little bit about what resources and support systems are essential for public schools to implement really and sustain, implement and sustain. So I know that's also a challenge, ambitious climate actions. Let's think big, and what does it take to get there? Anyone who wants to share can jump in. <laughs> well, I, I, I can start a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I'll start. Uh, so we provide some resources, particularly focused on, uh, on what we call priority school districts, which are the disadvantaged districts. We want to make sure that they have the capacity to apply for the funds that are available. There is a significant amount of federal money available right now, uh, but we've got guidebooks and uh, various resources on uh, at, at the WRI Electric School Bus Initiative uh, for anybody who's interested in that. The other part of this is if you look at the, in, in the U.S., the Inflation Reduction Act, in addition to the, the Clean School Bus Program, which is part of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, there are a number of tax credits that are available to school districts. Um, most school districts aren't used to filing tax re returns because they're nonprofits, uh, but many of the tax credits are actually available in what's called direct pay, so nonprofit entities um, can take advantage of them directly, uh, and that's new. So uh, we worked with Aspen and produced a guide for school districts how they can take advantage of these direct pay provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act so that they can uh, put solar on their school and invest in heat pumps. Uh, there are, in addition to the direct funding for school buses tax credits, that are applicable to uh, electric school buses as well and charging infrastructure. So um, just a lot of resources that many schools uh, may not be aware of uh, or aware of how to take advantage of. So federal resources, leverage them, use them, invest, use those funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I can add on to that, these tax credits are not like grant applications. You don't have to apply and earn them. They're non-competitive. Every school in the country, every non-taxable entity in the country, community colleges, other institutes of higher education, nonprofits, churches, are able to take advantage of these tax credits. And they're pretty significant, the base credit, if you meet certain domestic content requirements and prevailing wage requirements is 30%. That goes up to 40, 50, 60% with some of these add-ons for um, entities located in low-income areas, energy communities. And so say you're a school and for ease of calculation, you install a renewable energy project for $100,000. Um, you can get up to $60,000, did that math right? $60,000 back as a direct payment from the IRS. 
And so you're then able to kind of take that money, reinvest it into infrastructure, reinvest it into your school system. So really the potential here is enormous. And I think we all, um, higher ed institutions, nonprofits, philanthropy as business have a role to play in ensuring that schools are aware of this and that they can take advantage of it. Audrey, who cares? I think I, I can definitely echo that schools need to have access to this information. There's so much out there. If only educators, especially like district administrators, were aware of it and had access to those resources. So I truly love that there's organizations out there doing that. And I especially hope that more community members themselves will bring it to the attention of their local school boards and district administrators. But sort of moving to the support system side of it, Particularly for my district, I think having the support of city governments would be huge too. So a big sort, I don't want to say blockade, but sort of something that's stopping them from expanding green spaces is that cities already have their ordinances. They have laws about how many trees you can have, where, how close you can have it to train tracks. All of these little details make it really hard for schools to sort of find a way to plan these things without spending an exorbitant amount of money into making sure that they're legally doing it and they're also like sustainably doing it. They won't have to tear off this tree if they choose to expand on a building later down the line. So ensuring that there's that relationship established with the city governments to create these spaces that are not only legal, but they are going to last long term even as districts grow or change is really huge. Thank you. Audrey? Oh, Danielle? Oh, go ahead, Audrey. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, so something that I've been thinking about a lot recently that I'm sure some of you can speak to further is the importance of um, green career pathways in schools. I recently visited a CPS school, um, Aiken High School, that has a um, agritech track for students to take. Um, and it's a Montessori school, so they're, um, you know, they have an emphasis on hands-on education and um, engaging students in different paths of study. But what was really interesting to me was that they were focusing on sustainable agriculture and, you know, ensuring that students are leaving the school with the skills to be able to work in a space that is shifting more and more towards sustainability and, uh, and climate justice. And that is really exciting to me. And I think there's more schools that need to hop on that train um, of, of, of providing pathways to green careers. And another pathway is, you know, we see schools more and more um, having more education on engineering. So, you know, uh, teaching students how a solar panel works or, um, you know, how to have effective irrigation in, in, a, in a garden. So I think those sorts of things are, are really important for schools to have. Um, and then also, in, just on a side note, empowering students in schools with the ability to implement effective policy change, because climate change is unique in that students and young people in general are going to be the most impacted. So they need to know how to be leaders in that policy change space because the policies that are implemented are going to be the ones that are going to imp impact them for the rest of their lives and of course future generations as well. Thank you. Danielle? Yeah, um, you guys are saying yeah. everything is amazing. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to kind of layer on the fact that there are so many wonderful um, in particular, we've been working with a number of school districts on um, well, under a U.S. Forest Service grant, um, Urban and Community Forestry Program, and it will set up um, basically schoolyard forests across the country and in places where tree canopy is already lacking. So um, tap into your nonprofits that are working with you or that are doing aligned work within your region because that's an area where they can provide support to apply for the grants. Um, I know school districts are often very stretched thin in terms of having capacity for grant writing, but your nonprofits can really be a big help there. Um, another really <laughs> wonderful grant that's open right now is the EPA Community Change Grant. We've been working with school districts across the country to apply for that because it is impactful. You know, it does provide funding for installation of solar panels and, um, you know, charging stations and electric school buses, but also for, you know, stormwater management mitigation and heat island reduction. So, you know, all, all can cover <laughs> under that grant. Um, and I think it's just a matter of really making sure the 
people, they are, and that nonprofits can really help you get to the finish line in that grant. Thank you. Margaret, did you want to add? Yeah, I'll just add on to that, yeah, that it seems, seems like the common theme is that there's a lot of out there, and it's just really, um, and they're very, they're, they're, we want all schools to reach there, and I think that's ambition, um, when you talked about what's the ambitious plan, and a lot of the times it goes back to like, I know there's that famous book on like, how, like how to build habits, it actually starts with identity, right, so how can we make schools start thinking and administrators and educators embody and see themselves as part of the climate solution because I think that there are a lot of initiatives that don't see uh, education as part of a mitigation strategy. So there's no wonder that an admin or an educator already so busy won't go in to think about how I'm going to play a role in you know, electrification, school buses, and all those wonderful initiatives that our panelists have talked about. So it's step one is how do we bring schools as more of the conversation for when we talk about climate change uh, mitigation? And then the second thing is giving the, those people time to do that, right? Because there might be the will and the power to do that, but it's really something as you know, as basic as having time when we think about ambitious plans. So that's kind of where I think that we could um, all work together on elevating education. Because when we do that, we're helping shifting the identity. Thank you. And that really resonates with the work that I do at FXP Climate Advocates, really helping young people gain the skills, the knowledge, the resources they need to be Audrey and Karis to push for those policy changes. So we want to leave time for question and answers. We want to hear from you. What do you want to know? We have these amazing wealth of resources here and who've already shared a lot of uh, funding opportunities and frameworks. Please, uh, if you can, don't mind standing up, say your name sure, and sure. ask your question. Hi, uh, my name is Leticia Hahn, and the question is for you, Karina. Uh, you mentioned that um, you believe that all schools should have some climate action uh, initiatives going on. Given the political arena in this country that uh, people pulling to the right, to the left. How do you envision that happening? Well, I think climate change um, is not, from the, young, from the young people I work with and from their perspectives, it's not a political issue. This is something that's threatening their health, their lives, their well-being. So as long as young people are at the forefront, like Audrey and Paris, speaking about the changes that can happen and the, the resources. You know, I think the like the polarization piece, I think at the local level looks very different and a lot of those changes happen at the local or state level. So I, there's a lot of hope, at least I'm very optimistic, that even in spite of sort of the national polarization at the local level, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, unity. And we've heard today about bipartisan uh, collaboration around climate issues, and I think there's a Gen Z panel tomorrow as well around bipartisan collaboration. Thank you. That's a great question. Okay. Thank you. And I don't yeah. know if anyone would like yeah, to Yeah, you guys want to add? Yeah. Yeah, I think another part of that is ensuring that we get out to vote in school board elections, mm -hmm. which are some of the lowest attended elections. Um, if you look at, you know, the Yale climate change data, people support climate education um, as a solution. I think it's 75 percent across the country. Um, and so we need to make sure we have the right candidates running for school board. Uh, there's a student that we work with in Boise, Idaho, who his school board was not taking action on climate change. So he ran for school board and he won. Um, so he is an elected member of that school board and he's leading climate action in that area. And so, um, again, get out and vote and also ensure that the right people are running for office or school board. Yeah, and I think finding the, um, finding the common denominators. Um, you know, everybody cares about kids. And everybody cares about the environment to a certain extent, right? Um, climate, I think, is very politically charged, but it's moving away from that. I think that will be a change in the, the kind of parlance. But for right now, yeah, it's politically charged. So when we're doing our um, advocacy with different uh, members, we're finding ways in through, um, you know, screen time reduction. The more kids are playing, the less they're going to be on screens. And so that resonates across the board. Or, um, you know, mental health. Children's mental health is really an issue that everybody cares about. So that's there are common denominators out there, and it's really a matter of finding them and, and wrapping your language in the right way because at the end of the day, this change has to happen, and we just have to be really smart about getting there. Yeah. Yes, please. Hey, your name and your uh, Hi, my name is Ariane Evans, and I just graduated from the Ed School, which I know we have 
panelists and panelists. Um, and one question I have for you and for the student uh, panelists is education is inherently people are coming in and out. Like you're on a four year cycle and for the ed school, we're on a one year master's program. And so I think like Margaret and Michelle and there's various people who come through the ed school who have a passion for this, but it's hard to keep it sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so for the panelists, I mean, you all are doing amazing work, but you're seniors um, next year, it sounds like. And um, also just for all the panelists, the champions you work with in your work, whether it's teachers or um, head of schools or principals or district leaders, like there's an inherent transience within the sector field of education, which I find complicated and also awesome because there's so much new energy all the time. So how have you all been able to cultivate champions, but also make sure as you graduate, are you making sure you have younger students who are, you know, you're passing the baton? Because um, I can, I know the frustration you pour your heart into an initiative and by the time you're a senior, you don't know if it's going to last. And so, um, yeah, if anyone has advice on that, that'd be great. It's something I've struggled with this year at the ed school. and I'd love to see Harvard's ed school doing more on climate education to make sure that district leaders and policymakers are thinking of this before they go back into the field. So. Yeah, I can uh, talk to that. So yeah, obviously this is something that I'm thinking about. Um, and I'm sure Karis is and, and any, any student, especially in high school or college who is, um, you know, pushing for climate action. Um, so I think one thing that I've learned is um, the value of making space and taking space as a leader, um, which I feel like any good leader should channel. Um, so obviously, as a leader, um, as the student leader of the campaign, I have to make sure that I'm doing everything I can and everything in my power to push forward our goals. But at the same time, I'm not going to be the leader forever. So I need to make space for new leaders to arise in every way that I can. So for instance, um, if, I, if I ever go speak to any community leader or stakeholder, I make sure that I am not the only student there. That I have other students who may not be, you know, as involved in the campaign um, to show them, you know, what the work that I'm doing and what the work that these student leaders looks like. Um, and also making sure that you have simply just an, an age range, right? So um, we have freshmen, eighth graders, uh, seventh graders in our campaign that are involved um, in, in, in leadership positions to some capacity. And then I think also making sure that you are taking plenty of time for um, bonding, right? Because this is hard work and sometimes it can be really tiring work. Um, but if we make it so we feel like we have a support system of our friends, of people that we trust and, and that we love, um, that can also be really important. And then when you go off, you know, to something else, um, you've left people who feel really at home in this change making space. That's super important. So, you know, whether it's doing a fun icebreaker before a meeting or bringing food <laughs> or whatever it is, like there's there's ways to really make it feel like a strong community. And I think that's super important as well. Margaret? And, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. You should go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. I was just gonna briefly echo that sentiment. Like my group also, we have members all the way down to middle school. So ensuring that you are consistently reaching out to even younger students than myself, I don't know all the answers. It would, uh, I would be somewhere far, far away if I knew all the answers to the universe. But ensuring that you have multiple perspectives in the loop, contributing so your group is always evolving and it's prepared from the get-go to move on from your leadership. But I think on an institutional side, that really highlights the importance of putting in place um, groups like student advisory councils or campus-based groups to ensure that even when one class leaves or like a whole set of four-year class leaves, so like let's say you have your freshmen all the way up to seniors, they've all phased out by now, you still have this program in place that ensures that students are consistently being cycled in. So this conversation is always going on because where the district was economically maybe six years ago when 
I was like in middle school is not where the district's going to be when I graduate. And it's definitely not where the district's going to be six years past my graduation. So putting in place those programs can go a long way to ensuring that these conversations continue to happen and this work is always ongoing. Right. Thank you. And on, on that, like, um, it was great to hear about the student, like how you can maintain like student involvement in terms of administrators and educators. Unfortunately, this question is really relevant because there's a lot of teacher turnover and it can't be based on that one teacher champion that's like getting all the, the other teachers like to teach about climate change or really think actually a lot of teachers are instigators for a lot of the the infrastructure changes, but I think it's yeah, the existing infrastructure. So I know that in California, the University of California and California State Universities are actually coming together, um, have come together through an initiative called Eclipse. So, so oh, now you can hear <laughs> the initiative <laughs> called Eclipse. So that's really powerful because they're thinking about systems level, what can we do in pre-service teacher training? So even if we have that teacher turnover, teachers that are getting certified to teach are learning about climate change and building that basic knowledge of climate change as well as best practices for how do you teach about climate change. They're also looking into induction specialists and administrators and so and then you know that um, higher ed are powerful places where teachers continuously get in service training. So looking at all these systems that already exist for um, continuous um, development of educators, for example, can be another way for longevity. Um, just on that, since we are have uh, a higher ed climate action initiative, I would be remiss to not mention that beyond education schools and educator schools, I think it's the responsibility of every higher ed institution to ensure that no matter what students are going on to do, they have that exposure that helps them understand how their sector and how their career is going to be impacted by climate. So whether you're going on to be a teacher, an administrator, uh, a doctor, a dentist, you need to know the impacts of climate change and the solutions as well. And I, I guess I specifically want to praise the work of the Salada Institute. I think one of the areas of work is ensuring that climate change is part of the curriculum of, you know, across undergrad and all the graduate schools. I'm an alumna of uh, the Kennedy School, and I'm really embarrassed to say that when I graduated in 2008, I was not, you know, climate change was just not part of our curriculum at all. And I think to train public servants and to not talk about climate change is just completely missing the mark. And we're really grateful for the work that the Salada Institute is doing now. And I think it's going to make a big difference. Thank you. Well, last question, because we only have two more minutes. Go ahead. Yeah. My name is Charles Gilden. I'm just recently graduated from Kennedy School. I have four children and often they'll come home and tell me something they're going to do about climate change. And in my profession, I go, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it may make you feel good, but it's not moving the needle. So the question maybe the students are on the panel, what skills are you being taught to look at a thing and say, this feels really good, but it's going to do nothing on climate change? And so I, because I, I hear a lot about people doing a lot of things. My concern is that we're going to do a lot of things that are really not have any impact. Mm -hmm. So I want to address that question because I, when I started, when we started the FXP Climate Advocates Program from scratch, we had students, high school students, who really hyper focused on like the reusable water bottle, for example, or reusable bags, which are wonderful things to do, right? But um, you know, and I did some research, and so I really struggled, like individual action, policy change, what matters more. And there is a researcher whose name, of course, now escapes me, that shows that individual action matters because it gets people to think about these issues and they're more likely to advocate for the policy changes you know down the line so that that's a good news so it may seem ridiculous yes maybe using that reusable water bottle is not gonna you know reduce our carbon emissions significantly but the fact that your children are thinking about this issue will probably mean that they'll learn about it more as they get older and they may you know and they'll eventually become more um into policy advocacy that's kind of what the research shows that individual actions matter it's not either or that's kind of my take but someone else yeah can. i mean uh... But I think it's a really good question because we also have to uh, instill systems thinking and we have to have systematic change if we're going to have a response. So, I mean, my vision would be if every school has 
solar on the roof. It's all electrified, so they're not using any fossil fuels in the building. They have electric school buses. They have a community schoolyard that is uh, both providing a wonderful place to play, but also a place that is absorbing stormwater. You can use that experience to then, through the education and curriculum, expand students' understanding of how that scales to a real solution to climate change, where we're electrifying everything and we're using clean electricity to power all those devices, which is really the heart of the climate solution. So we really have to do both. Um, we get people involved with experience. We know that that's what uh, has the biggest impact, but then we have to have a curriculum that allows them to scale that um, up to the state level, the national level, and, and the global level. Yeah, so we need all of these pieces in place. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the Salada Institute for having us. Our amazing panelists, our high school students who joined us by Zoom, and we're so eloquent, and we're just really grateful to you for your questions. And please feel free, we'll be here, so you can come up and ask your questions. Thank you so much.